I am the reporter for the AFCC Model Standards. I co-wrote with John Gould the Art and Science of Child Custody Evaluations. But I think that the material that I'll be talking about comes primarily from my work uh, as a reviewer of other people's evaluations. And you can see the figures. I've done 736 for psychologists themselves. Uh, 1210 for attorneys, and I've consulted on 108 uh, issues involving board complaints or malpractice actions. And certainly part of what I see is indicators of bias. There are some changes, not too many, in the PowerPoint. If you want to get the PowerPoint as you will see it today, you can contact me or for anything else. There's my contact information. We're going to talk primarily about what are referred to as cognitive biases, uh, as opposed to the biases that people are more accustomed to talking about. Cognitive biases really relate to the ways in which we process information. And the cognitive biases really show up in all the stages of an evaluation, the gathering of the data initially the initial and subsequent attempts to integrate the data, and then ultimately the formulation of opinions and if recommendations are being offered, uh, the offering of recommendations. In the data gathering process, there are several ways in which it shows up. I would suggest that none of you go running to Google if you're online to try and find all of these, because some of them were made up by me so that I could talk about them. <coughs> And you won't find them, I don't think, anywhere out there in the rest of the world. And I'll talk about them in as much detail as I can. Same thing with data integration. Uh, there are several ways in which it shows up. For those of you that are keeping track, you will notice that there's some overlap, and that's deliberate. Some of these things show up at each of the three stages. And again, with the opinions and recommendations. Uh, there are a whole bunch of them that, that show up, and we will talk about as many as we can. Um, one of my favorite examples of a case involving confirmatory bias um, was a case that went before the court. It involved a request for recusal. And what's interesting about what uh, Kennedy wrote in the opinion was we do not question Chief Justice Benjamin's subjective findings of impartiality and propriety, but, and the part after the but is, but we don't agree. And, and part of the point being made is that very few people, when asked to look at their own work, look at it and say, yeah, I, I guess you're right. That was a pretty subjective call. Uh, we tend to view ourselves as having been objective. One of the studies that I think is worth looking at, whether you are involved in cases involving allegations of child sexual abuse or not, is this study by uh, Everson and Sandoval, where the bottom line, it happens to be relating to child sexual abuse, but it could have been about anything else, is that evaluators examining the same evidence often arrive at substantially different conclusions in forensic assessments of child sexual abuse. And I just want to try and show you um, diagrammatically what we're really talking about here. Just look at what I'll call data set A. And this, in essence, is what this study did. It took a data set, and it showed that with the same data set, people come up at two different decision points. But that's not real life. Because in real life, you are not provided with the data set. You are also the gatherer of the data, which means in real life, you're starting on my diagram at zip. So that if bias shows up in the data gathering process, not just in the data integration, data interpretation process, and you start at the real point in real life, the zero point, then you're already diverging, that people with different biases will arrive at different data sets. And then from those different data sets, you will have differences. So then you can really look at the extreme left-hand side and the extreme right-hand side of the diagram and see 
how divergent opinions might be in a real life situation where people for, are starting from scratch and where issues of bias affect the data integr I'm sorry, the data gathering process. Uh, I think, though I don't know that this can really be empirically demonstrated, that the cognitive bias that we encounter most often in custody evaluations is the primacy effect. Basically, the person who gets his or her word in first has an edge. And there's really a tremendous amount of evidence to suggest that this is the case. One of the best simple demonstrations of this appears in a book, and I give you the site for the book, uh, by Gary Belsky and Thomas Gilovich. And essentially what they do is they set up an experiment where they have uh, an initial public offering for a company, and they present you with a fact sheet. And basically the fact sheet looks like this. There are two different versions of it. On each fact sheet, there are 10 facts. They are identical for both groups. But for group A, the five positive facts come first, the five negative facts come second. For group B, the negative facts come first, the positive facts come second. And what Belsky and Gilovich found is that the decision that you are asked to make in this experiment, you want to buy this stock or not buy this stock, is dramatically influenced by which set of facts you were presented with first. So that the point is, that if people start evaluations, as most people do, seeing one person before the other, as opposed to the Martindale method, which is bring them both in together with very few exceptions, the person who comes first gets to form the mental framework from which everything else follows. You will notice, I think, since I've kind of highlighted it in blue, the year 1935. I emphasize the year because one of the pitches that I make particularly to my colleagues is the lo a lot of the stuff that we ought to be utilizing in our work is old stuff. I'm a big believer in continuing education, but sometimes in our emphasis on continuing education, we forget that there's some really good old stuff out there that we ought to be utilizing. Back in 1935, a guy by the name of Leeper did an experiment in which he demonstrated dramatically that if you present people with a visual stimulus that looks something like this, whether they see it as a B or they see it as a 13 depends entirely upon what they saw first. If you show them a bunch of numbers and then you show them this, they all see it as, as a 13. If you show them a bunch of letters and then you show them this, they all see it as a B. And, and this, when Leeper first wrote about it, he called it mental set. And it's now taken on some other labels, expectancy effects, things of that sort. But the bottom line is that, again, a mental framework is formulated. Now, take a quick look at this. You all recognize Martha. Take a quick look at this. You all recognize Donald. What's interesting about these covers is that unless someone draws your attention to it, you're not even aware of how many of the letters in the word Newsweek are being obliterated by Martha's head and by Donald's head. And the reason you're not aware of it is because you, without even realizing you're doing it, you fill in the blanks. And this same kind of dynamic, which is demonstrated by experimental psychologists who study perception occurs in real life in settings such as child custody evaluations. I will also point out, however, that in this strong emphasis on primacy effect, there's also a recency effect. That the person, again, if you're doing it where at the end somebody goes last, the person who gets to talk to you a day before, maybe sometimes hours before you actually sit down and start preparing your report has a certain edge, is a name that I developed, the Jiminy Cricket bias. But one of the things that affects the quality of our work is really disturbingly cockeyed self-confidence that many of us have 
in abilities that we don't have. And it is remarkable how many mental health professionals have this delusional belief that we can ascertain who's BSing us and who's being candid with us. Um, and you see it all the time. And there is clear evidence that we are no better at it than anybody else. Um, diagram. A 15-minute assessment. <laughs> if you look at the contemporaneously taken notes from this evaluator's assessment, roughly one-third of the way down the page, on the very first page of the very first session, you see the marginal notation LLPF. I don't have time for the whole long story, but LLPF stands for Liar, Liar, Pants on Fire. <laughs> And what it tells you is that roughly 15 minutes into her very first session with one of the people being evaluated, she had already concluded that the person wasn't being honest with her. 15 minutes into an evaluation. How can you be objective past that point when you've already formulated this opinion? Um, this is from an actual report. The honesty of the children leaps from the pages. The problem is the evaluator doesn't know, found out at trial, I think, that the note was written by the children with one of the parents um, assisting them in preparing the note. And there's no indication that the evaluator even asked, you know, when did you guys write this note, where, and so on and so forth. What some of you have encountered, I know this because you tell me these stories, is evaluators who even opine about people they have never, ever laid eyes on. And one of my favorite examples is this one. This is from an actual case. And I think what's coming up is the deposition. OK. The, this is a pretrial de deposition in which the evaluator is, of course, indicating what it is she will be testifying to at trial. And the evaluator says she will be testifying that Mr. Smith is a batterer. Her opinion is based upon having viewed a deposition, video deposition, of Mrs. Smith in which she described her alleged abuse. At the expert's deposition, she asserts that what Mrs. Smith described was consistent with what is known about domestic violence relationships. So I didn't need to do further corroboration of it to offer that opinion. So here's an evaluator who's telling you at a deposition, I don't even need to know anymore, as opposed to it would be nice if I knew more. Uh, but more information is not available to me or the person's not available to me. Uh, so I emphasize this only because when we are really boxed in and we have to express opinions with limited data, we're supposed to articulate the limitations of our data. And here's somebody who says, I, I don't need any more. One of the problems that I see the most when I look at other people's evaluative reports is what I call marital mindset bias. They're focused on the marital relationship. They end up giving you information that bears upon the behavior of each person toward the other person in the marriage. This is not an evaluation of spousal behavior. The court is not interested in ascertaining which of these two spouses was the nicer to the other? Which of these two was the nastier to the other? Who's at fault for the termination of the marital relationship? That is not the objective. And it, it is really disturbing sometimes to find all this focus on marital behavior. Uh, and it then leads into concerns about fairness to the parents. We're not, this sounds terrible, but we're not supposed to be concerned about fairness to the parents. We're supposed to be concerned about the best interests of the child. There are people who, in my view, have not made the therapeutic to forensic mind shift change, and they insist on doing interventions in the middle of evaluations. This is from a deposition. I'm trying to improve the circumstances between the children and their father. Not your job. You're supposed to describe the relationship between the children and their father. You're not supposed to try and improve it. Associative bias. We see this very frequently, a positive bias that develops 
when evaluators discover, usually inadvertently, that they share beliefs, interests, experiences, and so on with one of the litigants. And cartoon, I become more in touch with my biases. It seems I can only relate to people who remind me of myself. <laughs> This is an example from an actual case where you have um, a, a, a mother, let's say, who is discussing with the evaluator the fact that she wants the kid to take piano lessons. The father's attitude is, ah, oh, leave the kid alone. Unbeknownst to the litigant, the evaluator is in exactly the same situation in her marriage. She wants their kid to take piano lessons. Her husband is saying, leave the kid alone. How do you not form a kind of associative bias with regard to a situation like that? But this, of course, is something that an attorney is never likely to uh, uncover. The cornucopia fallacy really relates to the fact that some people seem to believe that the more information you include, the better, without any real concern for, but is it relevant? And of course, sometimes it's not only not relevant, it's a distraction, it may be prejudicial, uh, now, confirmatory bias refers to the tendency either to seek or to be disproportionately attentive to the information that serves to confirm your initially generated hypotheses. Under some circumstances, confirmatory bias becomes confirmatory distortion, where there is an active attempt to place in a report information that's supportive of one's hypotheses, now opinions, and not place in the report information that is non-supportive of one's initial hypotheses, now turned into opinions. And a very dramatic example uh, for which an evaluator is, uh, I was going to say, is currently on trial, actually the trial is now over, involves a question of child sexual abuse where the evaluator, in order to assist the attorneys who would subsequently prosecute her, um, videotaped her sessions with the child. And the child, three years old, is asked directly, what color is daddy's penis? Green. What comes out of it? A tablecloth. Is it wet or dry? Dry. These three questions and these three answers are not referenced anywhere at any time in this evaluator's reports to the court, correspondence with the court, and I would say that the typical person looking at these three questions and these three answers might formulate the hypothesis that the child has never seen her father's penis and is just wildly guessing at the answers to these questions. Innovative assessment bias. Some evaluators seem to believe that they have developed a new and better way of assessing for certain things. There's no doubt that there are some deficiencies in our current assessment methods. But some people's innovations don't make the situation any better. I'm going to read to you very, from a very small hunk of the deposition of an evaluator who uses what I have referred to as the lock them in a room technique. The background is each parent comes to the office with the child. When the mother comes with the child, part of the time is spent alone with the child, part of the time is spent observing the mother-child interaction, and part of the time is spent alone with the mother. The attorney's questions at the deposition relate to that portion of the session during which the evaluator met with the mother. The child in this case is four years old. Question. While you were interviewing mother and child, I'm sorry, while you were interviewing mother and child was in your waiting room, was the child able to hear your interaction with the mother? Oh, oh no, the door was shut and it was locked. She was locked in a little waiting room that I have, and I always make certain that the child is comfortable. I don't just suddenly say, you're staying here and we're going inside. I finesse it so the child will be excited to play with the toys that are there, and I let them know they can knock on the door if they need to. How many times did she knock when you were with the mother? I can't remember, but it was more. So number one, she's got this interesting theory that knocks on the door somehow is a measure of attachment. If the kid knocks on the door more when mom's on the other side of the door, that means she's more attached than, you know, if the number is less with dad. Interesting theory, but I would say that 
not only is it not generally accepted, <laughs> but what's more disturbing to me is if you really believe in it, then why aren't you at least keeping track of the number of knocks? <laughs> Data integration. Now, my favorite example, because it comes from the United States Supreme Court, relates to the Troxel decision on grandparents' rights. If you look at the Troxel decision, you will find that the Supreme Court took a little bit of a poke at the trial court judge because the trial court judge said that in order to formulate his opinion, he had felt it appropriate to look back at some personal experiences. And this is a real flaw in the work that is frequently done by psychologists, that we make this totally crazy assumption that what worked in my life will work in your life, what didn't work in my life won't work in your life, um, that my experience can be used by me as a guide as I reflect upon your life. It doesn't work that way. Um, unfortunate past as excuse. Obviously, I made this one up. There are evaluators who become sympathetic with parents because of things that have happened to them in their past, and they then allow that to affect them in the formulation of their opinions, and they cut these people some slack because, after all, this person was raised by an abusive parent. I don't really care. If a person was raised by an abusive parent and it has turned them into an abusive parent, that's I need to focus on the fact that this person is now an abusive parent, not where it came from. Um, Mr. and Mrs. Jones have two children. Mr. and Mrs. Smith have three children. That's five, by the way, total children being affected by this. Mr. Jones and Mrs. Smith commence an atypically overt adulterous relationship, which continues unabated throughout the course of a custody evaluation being conducted in connection with the Joneses' divorce. From the evaluator's commentary, in order to understand Mr. Jones's behavior, it must be seen in a broader perspective. Throughout his life, Mr. Jones has borne the burden of trying to meet expectations communicated to him by his parents. He's 37 years old. It was time for him to individuate and break free of parental control. His adulterous relationship was undoubtedly his way of letting his parents know that he was now his own person. So here's an evaluator who casts this adulterous relationship in a very positive light. Um, 37 may be a little bit late to grow up and tell your parents, hey, I'm living my own life now, but better late than never. Okay, opinions and recommendations. How am I doing on time? I was going to. About 25 after. Okay. Um, the Newman bias. Remember Newman? Edward, uh, what me worry? There are people who express optimism for which there is absolutely no basis. And in particular, people who either themselves still do therapy as opposed to just doing forensic work, or people who have been in therapy and feel that it has had some miraculous effect upon them. And they will make recommendations that, that basically hinge on the notion that so-and-so will get therapy, therapy and then everything will be fine. How long does it usually take to work through abandonment issues? <laughs> and we forget the fact that not only does therapy not always work, but sometimes when it works, it takes a long time. Oh, and by the way, there's also evidence to suggest that people who enter therapy in response to externally imposed pressure don't do as well as people who have chosen to enter therapy. So here's a case where the people have been litigating between 01 and 10. There's no reason why these two parents can't, and it goes on to talk about why they can't learn to cooperate with one another. It, with this track record, you may not know what the reason is, but clearly there's some reason there that has prevented them from cooperating. Empathy bias, disregarding parental behaviors that have negative consequences for children simply because the evaluators have empathy for the parents who have engaged in the behaviors, or in some cases, the evaluators can imagine themselves making the same mistakes. Marital mindset. Uh, one parent has dramatically greater job flexibility than the other parent, and the parent without job flexibility basically complains 
that it's not fair that this particular condition, the availability, the greater availability of the other parent should be factored in. And the evaluator expresses his support for the litigant's position that it's not fair. And again, we're not concerned about fairness to the parents. If one parent is significantly more available to the children than the other parent, that's a factor to be taken into consideration. And I would point out, by the way, that in some states, it's a legal issue, meaning in some states, the criteria that we are supposed to be considering are statutorily defined. And availability may be one of those statutorily defined criteria. So you can't simply say, I'm not going to pay any attention to that because I agree with litigant B. It's really not fair. Cut me some slack. Well, this kind of overlaps a little bit. But this also from a report. We must be mindful of the fact that it is Mrs. Carson's attention deficit disorder that has kept her from being on time to appointments and that has led to her forgetfulness and disorganization. No, it's not our job to be mindful of the fact. It's only our job to consider what the effect is upon the children of this parent's behavior. Uh, parental needs. There are evaluators who actually address very directly the parent's needs. One of the most dramatic ones I came across was, Mrs. Doe's request to relocate must be examined with the dependency features of her personality in mind. Her need to have Joey in her life on a day-to-day -day basis is strong, which also suggests, for those of you that aren't thinking really ahead, that if her need to have Joey in her life on a day-to-day -day basis is so strong, she might just turn out to be the kind of parent who really prevents Joey from obtaining age-appropriate independence and so on and so forth because she needs him to stay a kid. Um, the French have a term for this, déformation professionnelle, the tendency to look at things according to the conventions of one's own profession. In this case, I'm tweaking it a bit because I'm not talking about the profession, but the specialty within the profession, and in particular, clinical versus forensic. Many of you are probably not aware that the specialty guidelines for forensic psychologists has now become the specialty guidelines for forensic psychology, and it is now an official document of the American Psychological Association. Uh, for those of you that would like a copy, it has not yet been published, but it's been approved. Uh, contact me at my email address and I'll send you a copy. But two of the guidelines from the new specialty guidelines relate to this problem. Problems may arise by using a clinical diagnosis. Assessment in forensic context differs from assessment in therapeutic context. And one of the points that many of us have been making for a long time is that if a parent engages in behaviors that have a negative effect upon children, the best way to assist the trier of fact, which is the bottom line obligation, is to Describe the behaviors as well as you can. Indicate the ways in which you believe those behaviors have an impact on the children and not worry about giving it a name. The fact that some people's negative behaviors have labels and other people's negative behaviors don't have labels kind of leads us astray. So that if, if you end up playing the labels game, People who don't know any psychology are likely to assume that the person who qualifies for a label is more disturbed than the person who doesn't, when in fact, the person who doesn't may be engaging in behaviors that are more destructive for a child than the person who happens to qualify for one of our many labels. Biases revealed in contemporaneously taken notes. We, of course, can go back to the LLPF. Um, Mrs. Parent states that she believes that Mr. Parent is overprotective in ways that will ultimately be detrimental to the children. As an example, she asserts that he waits with the children until their school bus arrives. The children wait in the lobby of a Park Avenue apartment building. There's a doorman. All three children take the same bus. The bus stops at their door. The father does this despite the fact that the children have informed him that his behavior causes them to be teased by their classmates, and he's acknowledged this.
the evaluator has written in the margin of her notes, what's her problem? And my position would be, I don't think she has a problem. But if you feel she does, the person to ask is her. Don't ask rhetorically in your marginal notes. Say to her, what is there about your husband's behavior that you find troublesome? And then let her explain herself. Biases revealed in final reports. Male children need male therapists. An evaluator opines that a 12-year-old male child terminate therapy with his current therapist, a female, and commence treatment with a male therapist. The kid's been in therapy for 18 months, and no rationale is given for this. This is my favorite, so help me. Let's hope that this episode of How to Marry a Millionaire has finally come to a close. You have an opinion that the mother married the father for his money? Keep it to yourself. It's not relevant. I will say, based on my personal experience, <laughs> that lots of people marry other people for reasons some of which are not terribly healthy. Some of the relationships go down the tubes as a result, but some of the relationships grow and become very healthy relationships. The financial arrangement to which Mr. and Mrs. Smith have agreed requires re-examination in my view. It is unfair to Mrs. Smith. This was a situation in which the financial elements had already been dealt with, and the evaluator, expert in psychology, no credentials that I'm aware of in accounting, <laughs> opines on the financial arrangement. And I think I did pretty well, huh? That's because I talk fast when I have to. Thank you. <laughs> Again, as David said with respect to his uh, presentation, there may be some slides in here that you don't have in the materials, but they should not be substantive. If you see something up here that you don't have and you really want it, just send me an email and I'll be happy to send it on to you. Uh, bias has a particular technical meaning within the legal profession, within the rules of evidence, that's somewhat narrower than the scope of the subject as we're discussing it today. It's a very well-entrenched method of impeachment on cross-examination. It's a mode of impeachment available in all 50 states as well as under the federal rules of evidence. Uh, typically, as it's expressed or discussed in case law, it's spoken of in terms of a predisposition against or in favor of a party, uh, usually manifested in the form of some kind of relationship to that party or an interest in the litigation. Uh, an example from a judicial decision speaks of it in exactly those terms with respect to family relationships, business relationships, and so forth. Retention bias is the bias most often discussed in case law in connection with expert witnesses. And that is the idea that if I've retained you as an expert on my side of the case and I'm paying you that gives you an interest, that gives you a partiality, and therefore it might impact on the opinion that you're giving. Uh, an example, in one case that I, everybody knows, and in our custody cases, except in Texas, they're all in front of a judge, not a jury. Everybody knows if I bring in a witness and it's an expert, they're being paid. So that fact in and of itself is not going to be uh, dispositive uh, and carry much weight. But how about in one case that I had a couple of years ago where the retained expert came in? The only testimony basically that the expert was giving, it had to do with the mother's addiction, was, well, yes, she's recovered and she now goes to AA and she's been clean and sober for the last 19 months, but there's really no way to say she won't fall off the wagon next month. That was basically the scope of the testimony. How much have you been paid for your services to date? $36,000. Now, that raised the judge's eyebrows significantly. And then to make matters worse, turned out that when he made one diagnostic uh, illusion, uh, and I, I noticed the book that he had in his hand, he was using an outdated version of the DSM, <laughs> which led to the question, if they'd given you 37,000, do you think you might have used the right book? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Michael Tiger, a very well-known trial lawyer, has said an expert is someone who wasn't there when it happened, but for a fee will tell you what it must have been like. 
Here's another example. This is wonderful. You may want to buckle up for this one. <laughs> this is Dr. Unsworth in a case in Louisiana in 1954. The court says, we find these pearls of wisdom coming from the mouth of one who has taken the Hippocratic Oath. Question, is that your conclusion, doctor, that this man is a malingerer? Answer, I wouldn't be testifying if I didn't think so. Unless I had been retained by the other side, then it would be a post-traumatic condition. <laughs> I give you the sight so you know I'm not making this up. My mind is not sufficiently diseased to make up the things that people do in actual life. Uh, Irving Younger, who's one of the greatest, in my view, the greatest lecturer I've ever heard on evidence, described bias as an irrational predisposition in favor of or in opposition to a party. Uh, Black's Law Dictionary incorporates the same concepts. The APA uh, Dictionary of Psychology, Inclination, Tendency, or Preference. A charitable synonym for bias would be values. We all hold values of different types. They're not all substantiatable through evidence and so forth. One person's bias would be another person's value judgment. Uh, it's often an unconscious process. We're often unaware of it, as uh, Ziskin noted in his uh, treatise. Unaware of their own biases. When an evaluator is unaware of them, it magnifies the problem. It's ubiquitous. It affects everybody, evaluators, lawyers, judges, butchers, bakers, candles. We're all nothing but big bags of bias with feet. And we run around all day and our biases get us in trouble because they lead us to the wrong decision or to inaccurate decisions. A logical question, this is somewhat as an aside, but I've heard the question posed enough usually by mental health professionals, it's worth just taking a minute. Question has been put, well, if we know judges are biased too, then why do we care if, if the evaluator also brings his or her biases into the courtroom? Well, one answer to that is obvious. Bias is not a good thing. All right, so less is better than more. But also, more to the point, technically, it has to do with role definition. A judge is elected or appointed, at least in part, to act as an arbiter of social values. An expert witness is not in any way there as an arbiter, arbiter of social values. The sole role of the expert witness is to impart scientific or specialized knowledge to the court that the court otherwise would not have. Uh, it is not to sit in the place of the judge. So bias becomes a problem at a, a number of levels. Broadly conceived, as we speak of it today, we're really talking about any factor that impacts on the decision that really ought not to impact on the decision-making process, and many factors can contaminate it. In the context of a custody evaluation, that basically means any factor that's impacting on the evaluator's decision that doesn't have something to do, in a broad sense, with parenting capacity, developmental needs of the children, and the resulting fit, which many of you recognize as being the, the paradigm set up in the APA guidelines. If it has not have something to do with that, in the broadest sense you may wish to construct that, it really is an outside contaminant on the process of making the decision. A prevalent and dangerous myth, as much as uh, attention has been placed upon the issue of retention bias in judicial decisions, there's a myth out there. And that is that court appointment <laughs> equals an unbiased opinion. And nothing could be further from the truth. It does remove retention bias, to be sure. But it doesn't remove many of the other, any of the other biases beyond that that David mentioned earlier or that we'll uh, reference in a few minutes. Here is a decision, this is one of the most, in my opinion, unfortunate pieces of judicial writing ever, where the court, and the judge is a friend of mine, and he's a very good judge, and so forth. He referred, the report of such an expert is intended to provide the court with an unbiased professional opinion. He refers repeatedly to the neutrality of the expert, and then makes the point, and if I didn't have such high regard for this evaluator, I never would have appointed him in the first place giving rise to a whole set of problems with 
what we'll talk about, confirmatory bias on the part of the judge. This is the unfortunate result that you can get when somebody thinks that court appointment removes all bias. I've heard judges refer to the court appointed expert as my expert. And they appoint the same one or two or three over and over again. The reality is there's no such thing as an unbiased opinion. Bias is rampant. And I'm not going to read all of these things, but I wanted to put them in the presentation so you'll have them in your materials that you take with you so that you have the sites. Uh, here in an article uh, that David wrote, uh, talks about, uh, he quotes to Golding that bias is actually rampant. Uh, Ziskin said no assumption should be made that because it's court appointed, there's no bias. Refers to other types of bias apart from retention bias that can come in and have an impact on the decision making process. Uh, and his experience, he, he examined many, many custody evaluation reports and his conclusion was the same as mine is from reviewing a lot of reports that I've never found one and he never found one that did not have some indication of bias uh, within it. Uh, Jeff Whitman, uh, who uh, wrote that when, uh, many times when the witness on the stand refers to his accumulated clinical experience, it really means accumulated personal bias. Why is bias so <coughs> rampant and potentially destructive in the context of child custody cases? Because the very concept that is decisive, the concept of the best interest of the child, is a swampland of subjectivity. It is value-laden. It is a question that cannot be answered strictly on the basis of available empirical research. It necessarily requires value judgments to be made along the way by the judge. Uh, and evaluators very often, in trying to produce a work product pleasing to the judge, will be looking for a tiebreaker. And many times what breaks the tie is going to be a value judgment rather than the specialized knowledge of the psychology discipline. Uh, David, in his usual non-inflammatory style, wrote in one article that only fools would assert that they're free of biases. Custody evaluations, because of that best interest standard, or I don't even like to call it a standard concept, uh, are really a bias-rich environment. John Gould wrote, that when you get into this, just identifying which of the parenting values should even be assessed becomes a hornet's nest. Because your own, as an evaluator, the evaluator's own personal value judgments could come to bear on which ones they even decide to assess. Some examples. Let's take, let's suspend reality for a minute and let's assume we can do something we can't do. Let's assume we could perfectly predict the outcome of the child. If we give the child the parent A, the child will be a real high achieving kid, uh, will make a, will be very successful academically, uh, go on to advanced degrees, a very successful professional career, but will suffer occasionally from bouts of ulcers, will take some anti-anxiety medications and so forth, maybe an antidepressant now and then to get through with the, the stress. On the other hand, if we give the kid the parent B, the kid probably will drop out of uh, high school, maybe barely finish, will not only have no career, won't even hold a steady job. But as David referred earlier, like Alfred E. Newman, me worry, will be happy as a pig in slop. Will never experience a moment's stress or worry. Okay? How many say you give the kid the parent A? All right? The high achiever. I won't even ask you to raise your hands because I know. The mental health professionals will say, you go with parent B. <laughs> and the lawyers will say, pop the meds and get that money, you know. <laughs> uh -huh. How about teaching birth control? At what point do you start, to, is it right to start teaching the kid about birth control? Or should you teach abstinence only? Those are things that parents could disagree about. And that there's no empirical research that's going to provide a definitive answer. That is something that is going to be guided by one's personal value judgment. One parent, one parent thinks they should teach the kid how to use guns and firearms and things of, like that when they're 12. And the other parent says, no, this is terrible. Uh, 
teaching the child. I've seen this debated by uh, custody evaluators in various forms. I take into consideration, says one evaluator, whether the parents teach the kid to pray. And the other one says, no, I don't. Well, obviously, if you've got that kind of debate going on, you don't have general acceptance. You don't certainly don't have empirical research. It's a value judgment. Uh, one evaluator, I consider whether the parent has a sense of humor or not. All right? They all had a sense of humor before they had kids. All right? <laughs> every time I see this issue, because I belong to different forums where these things get, the, every time something about parents practicing S&M sexual practices comes up, off to the races with the debate about it, without anybody referring to, is there any empirical research to suggest that if they do this in private, it has any impact at all on parenting or outcomes for the children. Why is it bias-rich environment? No defined outcome criteria. Uh, this is from one court. It said the bottom line is the child's best interest equals the fact finder's best guess. And when you're dealing with that level of subjectivity in the environment of assessment, bias can have a tremendous sway. There's no empirically based weighting system for the various variables. Some states, by statute, list the variables or factors to be considered. Uh, other states, such as New York, the only statutory factor is domestic violence. All of the other variables and factors are prescribed by case law. And they just say to the court, consider the totality of the circumstances. There are no absolutes, and here's a whole bunch of factors. But there's nothing that tells either the court or the mental health professional which should be weighted more heavily. So, for example, one parent is much better at promoting the child's intellectual needs. They help them with their homework. They make sure they're motivated. They enrich the curriculum that the kid enjoys outside of school, and the kid is really into it. But that parent happens to be kind of a cold fish, not terribly empathetic, and so forth. The other parent, on the other hand, uh, you know, on education, not so much. Really doesn't think it's that important but is the warm, empathetic one who will listen, and if the kid has a problem, goes there for the hug. Okay, so you've got one factor on one side and one on the other. Which should weigh more? We don't know. Again, value judgments come into play. No systematic corrective feedback. This is all I always get a kick out of it. If you are cr What I do most of the time is cross-examine mental health professionals, and eventually you reach a point, if you've done it fairly thoroughly, where they'll concede that they've expressed many conclusions to which they cannot point to any empirical research in support, but they'll then say, oh, it's my clinical experience. Okay, well, let's examine your clinical experience. You've done 500 evaluations. On how many of those do you know the kid was placed in accordance or consistent with your recommendations? And they don't even know that. Of those who were placed consistent with your recommendations, do you know how many are in prison right now? Do you know how many are in mental institutions? Do you know how many dropped out of school as opposed to went on to an advanced degree? No, I don't know. It's not, nobody's fault that they don't know. There's just no system in place. And then the question is, so as far as you know, you could be getting worse instead of better. You know, and one witness actually said, you know, you've got a point. <laughs> I might be. Here are a number of types of bias. I'm only going to talk about one or two of them because of time constraints, but it gives you an idea, and David already talked about several of them. Uh, I'm going to talk in a minute about uh, confirmatory bias. I would just mention PETA bias. David names his Jiminy Cricket and things like that. Mine is, P I think this is a very important bias, PETA. You know what it means? You know what it stands for? Pain in the ass, all right? If your client, I'm talking to the attorneys now, if your client is a pain in the ass, I mean, to a greater extent than usual, all right, <laughs> you've got to make it clear to them that when they go in to be, see the evaluator, they should not act that way. Because there's, a, there's simply a certain bias that will attach because somebody is not likable. So if you've got a client who's constantly in your face and questioning your every move and has a real personality problem, you really need to try to iron that out before they meet with the evaluator for the first time. Confirmatory bias, which David mentioned, is the tendency to gather information uh, or evidence that supports your pre-existing belief. And the flip side is dismissing 
evidence that may be in front of you that would contradict your pre-existing belief. Um, examples have been given by various writers. It is not unique to custody evaluations. It's what happens in life. Uh, some examples. I read, Saddam Hussein has WMD, therefore we go to war. <laughs> they were presented with a mass of conflicting intelligence. Some of the data suggested he had it, and other data suggested that he did not have it. They, they had a pre-existing belief for a whole set of reasons that they had that he had it. Therefore, what happened? The, 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 the data points that suggested that he had it were given more weight than the opposite. Uh, I put this out as an explanation, unless you're a believer in conspiracy theories. Dan Rather, remember when he published the bogus document saying Bush had uh, ditched his National Guard service? I don't think Rather said, oh, I've got bogus documents, I'm going to go out and crucify Bush. I think he started with a preconceived idea, Bush is a bad guy, and therefore didn't examine the evidence carefully enough before going public. And I say that because about 12 minutes after he published them, some blogger detected that the font that was on those documents did not exist in the year 1970. If he had been carefully researching the information, I think that would have been discovered. Uh, the Virginia Tech shooting a few years ago. Police get there, find this girl dead. Somebody says, just left a date. You know, she, she had just been brought home by some, but some boy, some guy she was out with. The police always think when they find somebody dead for murder, their first thought is, who loves them the most? That's who did it. All right? The husband's always the suspect. The wife is always the first suspect. And what happened was acting on that preconceived belief, the entire police presence vacated the campus and went off to where that guy lived, not even considering that it was someone else who might still be at large. And that's why a whole bunch of other people got killed after they left the campus. And then conspiracy theories about 9-11. I don't look into these things, but I'm told that if you look at the data, you could pick and choose pieces of data that would support the argument that the, the truthers uh, put forth, that it was an inside job. The Rosenhan study, the pseudo-patients, is another example. And this is where, uh, as, a, as an experiment, Dr. Rosenhan sent a bunch of uh, grad students to mental institutions. And they described, they, they went there presenting as patients and described a symptom consistent with being paranoid schizophrenic. They were all admitted. They were all confined, some for as long as something like 156 days. Right? And John, uh, David uh, discusses this in his article. Ordinary behaviors were perceived by the mental health professionals, the doctors, the nurses, etc., as consistent with schizophrenia or paranoia, which was on the, uh, the chart. Because they come in, oh, patient A, first thing they look at is the chart, paranoid schizophrenic. All the notations they made in their notes about patient A were consistent with that. For example, the guy was writing. You know why the patient was writing? Because it was part of this, his assignment as a pseudo-patient. He was supposed to write down for the study what was going on. So instead of just saying, oh, I noticed the guy's writing, they put down, engaged in note-taking behavior consistent with schizophrenia. And so over courses of confinement, as long as 156 days, not one mental health professional figured out that these were pseudo-patients. On the other hand, some of the <laughs> other patients did. <laughs> I mean, one of the real crazy ones would go up to the doctor and say, something wrong over here with George. <laughs> George is normal. <laughs> And then they'd write in this guy's chart, having delusions again. He thinks George is normal. All right. uh, the research has shown that uh, confirmatory bias impacts on perception as well as recollection. You recall more of that what's confirmatory rather than what's disconfirmatory. In effect, it is a magnifier effect. All of the, these biases do not necessarily, and in fact, I don't think usually operate discreetly. They're interacting with one another. This one can interact on all of them and make them larger. Because once the initial bias is formed, that gives you that frame of reference David was talking about. And now because you have that frame of reference, you're disregarding things inconsistent and overweighting things that support it. <coughs> 
confirmatory distortion, which is actually a term David coined in his article, is how this, it's two things. It's how it manifests at its worst. But it's also, from the point of view of the attorneys, wonderful. Because it almost always will manifest in this way. And this is very detectable once you get into the report and then the file. All right? Because here we move from unconscious cognitive error into a realm of pure evility. All right. Where I'm comfortable. <laughs> here, here you have an evaluator who has come to a conclusion and now consciously writes a report that suppresses information that would point in a direction opposite to that conclusion. And in my experience, it happens on a very frequent basis, which is why it's so critically important to review the file and not just the report. Example, in one case, the evaluator recommended for dad. We get the file. In the file, we have report cards. The kids were in the temporary, the interim custody of mom as the primary custodian during the trial process, which in New York was a couple of years at this point. And throughout, the kids are going to school. And these report cards were just glowing report cards that any parent would be ecstatic to see. All right? And they were put in front of the evaluator. He had them in his file. Because they spoke well of mom, one could say these kids were with mom through these two years, they're doing great in school. That's at least one thing that cuts in mom's favor. Completely fails to mention anything about that issue in the report. In another case, selectively using the data. Uh, in my experience, more than half the time in the evaluations, the evaluators are using the computer-based uh, test interpretation reports, which I happen to think, but more importantly, many of the forensic experts in this room and at this meeting, I think, agree, you should never use those in a forensic context. But that's a different issue, and Jay and others can talk about it. But what happens frequently is they cherry-pick from the interpretive report. Let's say they're going to go against dad. They take all the negative stuff from the interpretive report they get from Pearson or Caldwell, and that they either quote or even worse, just block and copy and present in their report as though it's their own, and they leave out all of the positive things that were also said about dad from that report. You can work some very effective lines of cross-examination on the bias issue when you have that. Uh, another example. In one case, this, is, this was beyond belief. Every time the, evalu the evaluator was in favor of mom, every time there was a positive fact in the report about mom, he bolded it. It was in bold font. Whereas a positive fact about dad was not. Every time there was a negative fact about dad in the report, he bolded it. And vice versa, and, and conversely the other way. All right. And acknowledge that, you know, the purpose of bolding is because that's what you want to bring the court's attention uh, and focus upon. All right. Here's a wonderful example, right from a, a, an actual case. The wife, the, the, the evaluator here goes in favor of the father. The wife had a slightly elevated case scale, but it was still within the realm of the, uh, the Bathurst data that it was not inconsistent with custody uh, litigants. All right. Slightly elevated. In saying that it was an elevated case, yeah, the wife obviously was attempting to present an unrealistically positive picture of herself and potentially concealed psychopathology. In the same case, the father's K and L were so elevated, it came back that it was uninterpretable. And in noting that, the evaluator says, this is typical of responses from custody litigants, which is absolutely untrue. Most of them are interpretable, even though they may be trying to present favorably. Spotting bias, failure to employ methodological safeguards. This is directed mainly at the lawyers as you're reading through the reports and the file. All right. They fail to get, this is the most prevalent, failing to get both sides of the story. All right. Parent A comes in and tells something really damaging about parent B. And they never even call parent B back and ask them their version of that, but simply accept as one of their premises, one of their assumptions, what was told to them. Imbalance in time, duration, sequencing of interviews. 
Uh, this goes to the primacy recency thing that David talked about. Not only do a lot of evaluators not bring them both in at the same time for the first interview, I've seen more than one instance where they might bring one of the two parents in two or three sessions before they even meet for the first session with the other parent. That's suggestive of a problem. Uh, failure to employ multiple hypothesis testing, which they're uh, supposed to do. Uh, failure to seek disconfirming data. Failure to corroborate hearsay. Inclusion of data that's not even relevant to parenting. When you start seeing those things, you can start to develop the lines of cross-examination because they may have been the product of bias or they may have uh, caused the bias to occur because they didn't get the other side of the story. And then using selective data reporting is another one. Some examples from reports, things that jump out like red flags. In the first descriptive statement, this is an evaluator rep, uh, made a recommendation in favor of mom when she comes to describing the father. Very first thing she says, his sense of humor was off. That's the first sent descriptive sentence. The father Jack's sense of humor was a bit off. Leading to questions. Can you cite to any empirical research to establish, uh, that's in your literature, to establish a connection between somebody's sense of humor and their parenting function? Uh, can you show me in any of those uh, protocols, uh, the, the standards, guidelines, where it says you're supposed to assess for the sense of humor? Can you show me any empirical research that sets up an objective standard for what a sense of humor should be? Well, no. Well, then, as far as we know, maybe it's your sense of humor that's a bit off, doctor. <laughs> and then the very first description of Jill... Jill presented as a very attractive and engaging individual. And then the same kinds of questions about that. So what? That means, okay, you liked her more, which became evident. And then just ignoring reliability issues, which is fairly common. I'm going to skip through some of these. You have them on the slides, mainly hearsay. Uh, I, I'll just give you this one because it's just too good not to. Uh, in this case... The mother says to the evaluator, Jack's aunt told me that Jack's ex-wife told her that Jack in the first marriage shot off a gun in the house. And it was adopted as though it were gospel. All right. That's what that looks like. <laughs> right. That's the chain. <laughs> Adopt it as gospel. All right? And then the questions are in, in your materials. That's three or four levels of hearsay. The specialty guidelines, at least before this current revision, spoke very definitely about your responsibilities as an evaluator in dealing with hearsay. And then we just went on through that in terms of the cross. And then I'm just going to close with the primary safeguard, because I get asked this question by a value, what's the primary thing, the most important thing I can do? Not only to protect against bias, but all kinds of other errors. And my answer is always this. Base your conclusions, inferences, and opinions on the empirical research. If you want to say parenting behavior A, B, and C produces this positive outcome or that negative outcome, have something in support of that other than what one evaluator said to me from the witness stand. Well, that's by my inner lights. Okay. The research is out there on all kinds of important issues that can be very helpful to the court. And the more closely you anchor your conclusions and what you're willing to express to the research base that you have, you don't, you don't eliminate bias, but you can at least reduce the sway that it has. Okay, I think we have, that concludes this part. I think we have a couple of minutes left for questions. There is a slide up there where I mentioned that fail, fails to seek disconfirming information. So absolutely right. And that's what they teach you to do, right? That's part of, your, that's the, uh, part of the essence of the education that you get as a Ph.D. psychologist. Yes? How do you find out that your mental health person's biases? In my, from my perspective as a lawyer, I look for them in the report or in the uh, filed data, there are 
possible other external things you could get. I do Google searches. I, I always, whenever the resources allow, I always have a mental health professional as my trial consultant as opposed to a testifying witness. We look for disciplinary stuff. Sometimes a Google search will turn up something and it shows that this particular evaluator is like a regular at the father's rights meetings, that kind of thing. Well, that sort of thing you can use. But most of the effective stuff that I'm going to find is going to come right from a comparison of the report with the information that's in the file. How what? Telling the, telling the client, don't go in and be an asshole? Let, 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 me, let me jump in. Let me jump in, because AFCC recently released uh, a paper that deals with this topic that was put together by a task force of mental health professionals and attorneys. And if I can summarize the bottom line, the bottom line is that we work by different rules. Uh, the attorney is an advocate. There are things that attorneys can do that we are expected not to do. From my perspective as a mental health professional, the problem arises when we do things that, in my opinion, we should not do, meaning we engage presumably in the employ of an attorney as coaches to litigants, tell them what to say, what not to say, in some cases coach them on how to take certain psychological tests. I think that is terrible. But I don't think that we as mental health professionals should sit in judgment of another profession when the other profession's rules are different from our rules. Attorneys are expected to help their clients do well in evaluations. That's part of the reality we have to deal with when we're doing the evaluation. And just from the attorney's perspective, I mean, there's nothing unethical at all about me preparing, coaching, and getting a client ready to go do the evaluation. I, from a practical point of view, I limit what I do because I don't, if you, if you rehearse somebody, they come across as rehearsed. If you try to get somebody to be something that they're not, but for me to say to a client who's yipping and yapping about everything, look, the evaluator may decide that they want to do tests, and I know you've looked all those tests up on the Internet and say that they're all nonsense and they're not valid. Don't go saying that stuff to the evaluator because you're just going to be making a pain in the ass of yourself. Be cooperative with the process. And I don't even have a session with the client that is specifically, now I'm going to prepare you for the evaluator, my preparation would start at the very beginning, and it's, I'm preparing you for the case. And you know what? It's the same thing, because the same stuff you guys are looking for, the judge is going to be looking for. So in preparing them for the case as to what's going to work and what's not going to work, it's a preparing them for the evaluation as well. Arthur? Should they see the pleadings? They usually get them, in my experience, right up front as part of the initial packet that goes through. Yeah, if they read the pleadings before the first session, then they've already at least established some frame of reference, but I would defer to the evaluators as to how strong that may be. Arthur, I, I wouldn't say it, it's a bias. Um, it's really a question of what information you gather and in what sequence, and can we agree among ourselves with regard to what we should consider first, second, third, and so on, and we can't. Um, I would say that the advantage of seeing the pleadings is that it gives you a clearer picture, usually clearer than whatever's in the court order, of what the actual issues are that are in dispute, which then enables you to focus your inquiry more effectively. And I'll just point out when I talk about focusing the inquiry, that there are many evaluators these days who use pre-printed interview forms uh, from various organizations. And when you use the pre-printed interview forms, the questions that you pose are the same for every litigant you see. Instead of tailoring your questioning to the issues that are actually the issues in dispute in this particular case. You want I'm, I'm I, not exactly I, sure I understand. I, I think what you're suggesting is that there can be bias in the search for bias. Yes. Okay. Uh, the only thing I can say to that is absolutely. And, and to some degree, we, we go back to the, the problem of retention bias. Uh, 
um, when I am functioning as Tim's expert, and particularly if Tim has said to me, I want you to look at this because I think that there are indicators of bias in this work, uh, do I then enter the task free of bias? Of course not. So, so the only real issue then is, am I at least aware that this is occurring? Am I willing, if asked on the stand, to honestly acknowledge, of course, I'm, I'm a human being, I am subjected to the same forces that affect other people, mere mortals, even though they're not experts. With what? You mean if I'm the one commenting on the report? Oh. I'm not sure how to answer except to say that the way I do a review, if I feel that on balance the work has been well done, I'm going to tell the retaining attorney, I know this isn't what you wanted to hear, but I think on balance the work has been well done. I'm not going to say I found in paragraph three on page such and such an a possible indicator of bias, go after it. I, I don't think that's a service to the court. Other questions? Yes? Um, I, I don't think there's any research evidence that would indicate which of the two is stronger, but, but I will simply express my editorial opinion that neither one need be a problem if you meet with both people together the first time and both people together the last time, which is what I did for 16 years. And very few people do it, and very, very many people think that it's a problem. I don't see the problem. And I'll just throw in one plug for that procedure. If you look at social psychology research, you find that the willingness of people to accept recommendations, including recommendations they might not like, is to a large extent contingent upon their perception of the fairness of the process. So anything that we do that contributes to people's perception that we are trying our best to be fair increases the probability that our recommendations will be accepted. And certainly one of the things that contributes to this image of fairness is I started out seeing the two of you, I ended up seeing the two of you. I think we need to stop. I think Tim and I will hang around, but yeah, we uh, may have to vacate the I room, think, but we'll yeah. be around out, out back. Thank you.